Meanwhile, schools in England have been given few restrictions on how they will be able to operate when pupils return in autumn. The guidance published by the Department for Education imposes only a handful of demands, principally that primary and secondary schools uh, divide pupils into bubbles of entire classes or year groups, which in larger secondary schools will include hundreds of children. But few social distancing measures will be required within schools, with much of the advice left to school leaders to interpret, including recommendations about the staggering school start and finish times. Now, children and staff will not be required to wear face masks in schools, but children over the age of 11 traveling on public transport will need to wear a mask or face covering and maintain social distancing. We now have Ladi Mohammed, Governor of the Secondary School Enterprise Coordinator in London. And in Nigeria, we have here Fulayo Ajanaku, who is the Marginal Education Initiative uh, Nigeria School Development Executive. Good to have you, ladies. Thank you for joining, Ladi. And thank you, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you, Fulayo, for joining. I'll begin thank with you for Ladi. Me. Right, Ladi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right, thanks for joining us. Now, ha having had over a month of school resumption, uh, Ladi, for nursery and early years, how much buy-in would you say there has been amongst parents? Well, the growth rate here in the UK is between minus 4% and 2%, and our, our rate um, currently remains as a whole as between minus 0. 7 and 0.9%. So the R rate is below 1. So parents have basically bought into that. Mm -hmm. uh, most parents have complied and acquiesced. And, you know, hence most primary schools did return on the 1st of June. Year 10 and year 12 students also some did return on the 15th of June. And some primary schools have even fully opened on the 22nd of um, June. Right. Now, what challenges would you say have been encountered so far? Mm. Quite a lot, to be honest. Um, the biggest um, challenge has been heeding to and observing social distancing. Mm. Um, you know, natural instincts, for example, you know, a teacher wants to help a student and wants to support a student that they see struggling or is in distress and even fellow pupils you know you see your best friend in distress you the natural instinct kicks in that you want to go over and ask them what's going on or even hug them so these you know social distancing is quite challenging uh, moving around the school even in so-called bubbles um also how do we support students to adhere to and comply with the more stringent and infection control hygiene requirements that are now in place. Um, how do we help students maintain and stay in their bubble groups? You know, st students from different bubble groups want to play with each other. So that's quite, you know, something quite challenging. Mm -hmm. There's also the challenge that bringing in contaminated items, um, your lunchbox, uh, your bottled water, your pencil case, all these items you bring in from home that you would normally maybe swap or share with another student. You can't do that anymore now. Mm. Um, PPE, um, equipment for, uh, for um, teachers and school staff is also challenging. And then not to mention, I'll be honest with you, that the, the, uh, the challenges that will be presented come September. Will all year 10 and year 12 students, current year 10 and year 12 students, be expected to sit? full GCSE and A-level exams, given that they have missed up to six months of the curriculum. You know, you mentioned public transport earlier. Mm. You know, how do students who have to get to school, how do they use public transport to get to school if they have to use public transport? We can't expect them to work miles. So count, local councils are currently discussing this over here. Right. And, then there's also, uh, and then there's also the um, challenge of staggered start and end um, times. Timing. You know, mm -hmm. the school, schools are proposing that different year groups will start at different times so that they, you know, you can't mix the two bubbles, the class size bubbles. But I mean, what happens to someone like myself? You know, I have children in year seven and another child in year nine and another child in year 10. How do we manage this staggered beginning and end date? So mm. there's quite a few challenges. Yeah, the challenges are quite palpable there as you explained them. Let, let's turn to Fulayo now. Fulayo, comparatively, we have only heard about a government order for children in graduating classes in primary and secondary schools to resume school here in, in Nigeria. To your knowledge, how much has been done by the way of preparation to support this order? 
Okay, well, the um, government um, has mandated a start for August, so no schools have actually opened yet. But I have discussed with a few school owners, um, Standard Bearers, Sunnydale School, Global International School, just to take a, a sample of the different schools, primary and those who have secondary. And they have said that they are not, uh, they don't intend, and of course private, they don't intend to return because what they have actually done is that they've had town hall meetings with their parents and their parents are saying, we're not coming back. And now this morning, somebody sent me something that was on Facebook with the parent asking a whole lot of questions on how the school is going to ensure that her child is safe and well and does not get infected. And everything from, are they going to pay if their child gets infected, are they going to medical bills? Um, how are they going to keep, um, you know, if you think about it in Nigeria, there's a, children really interface with a lot of people. There's a lot of staff. There's a lot of everybody from the gate man to the nannies to the drivers to everybody taking the child to school and bringing the child back. And so all those interfaces, how are they going to manage them? And so the truth is that if a school says come back, the onus is on the school to ensure the entire line is secure. Mm. And so it's really quite impossible. And so schools who have been very good at doing distance learning are saying they're maintaining that. They're not going to change. And so the question now is, how do you ensure that the pupils continue to learn even through distance learning? So new curriculum, how are they introducing all of those schools or all of those items? So schools who are doing that very well don't really have an issue. Their parents are saying they're not coming back and they're quite happy to keep teaching their children online. Mm. Uh, let me just quickly add, for, for clarity's sake, those who are teaching, uh, I mean, the Lagos State government, for instance, has said there is no third term yet. So those who are teaching, what exactly, uh, what, what, what curriculum are they using? Is it a continuation of the second term or just, you know, engaging the, the children? Is, so that is true. So Lagos State has said there's no third term, but they, you cannot stop children from learning. Learning is a continuum. You can't tell a child, no, you can't learn the next thing. You have to stay back in what was second term, or you have to keep revising what you've learned before. And so what really the challenge will be is when the children resume. So when you reintegrate your children into school, what do you do to mitigate any differences and inequalities? Mm -hmm. And inequalities exist not just within a school, within a class. It exists within a school and even within a network. And so you have children who didn't do any distance learning at all. Some who did it a little bit, because if you can imagine in Nigeria, there's all kinds of things that happen, data, um, do they have um, power to power their devices. So some children would have got some of the distance learning down path. Some of them would not have done it at all, and some would have done all of it. And so when the children come back, apart from the health protocols, there has to be a plan for bridging all those inequalities, even within a classroom. So where you have 10, 12 children, four of them did the distance learning, three of them did it partially, and two of, uh, and the rest of them didn't do it at all. How does the school plan to make sure that all of those children get to where they want to be? Hmm. But in truth, if you consider that what we're supposed to be doing in 21st century education is really making sure that all the children are learning at their pace, that shouldn't be an issue. Right. So it's only when you are teaching to the middle will you have that sort of issue. But where you are really teaching properly, children at various stages should make sure that the goals, you should, the, the class teacher should make sure that all the goals are reached, mm -hmm. um, although the time is flexible. Right. So while you might not call it third term, a child who has learned everything and wants to continue learning must not be stopped. Mm -hmm. A child who has not learned must be helped. All right. So within the integration planning for every school, there must be that plan for mitigating any learning equalities within the school population. Right, thank you so very much, Funlaya. Let's now conclude with Ladi. Ladi, what of people who feel that the pressure of needing to get the economy going are informing what may be a premature resumption of schools and essentially putting children at risk? Um, it's a very good question we've been asking ourselves here as um, as a school governor and as even a practitioner within schools. You know, um, is the government moving too fast or something, you know, um, but there has to be a balance. You know, we can't put school off forever. Um, it's not reasonable to say that children can continuously miss school. Um, however, as you quite rightly pointed out, there is a danger of increasing 
say, a chance of a second wave if we go back too soon. Here in the UK, the government feels that infection rates are falling, the R rates that I mentioned yet earlier, and hence that we can relax the bubble sizes um, from even this month. And definitely from September, schools pupils will return to their normal group size, um, but with the safety measures that I mentioned earlier in place. Um, but you're right, legitimately, some people question the government speed at which children are being forced, and I use the word forced in inverted commas, mm -hmm. to return back to school, because here there is talk that they're going to fine us as parents um, if we don't return our children to school. Right. Um, but yet, as parents, we feel there are legitimate reasons that I, we might not want our children to go back. You know, for example, some parents say that, look, we live in a household that there is a vulnerable family member, a grandmother who is vulnerable, and yet the child can go to school and come back home and bring COVID into the house. You know, so there's all these legitimate reasons. Locally, has the R rate fallen? Oh. You know, for example, oh. Leicester last week here in England, the R Maybe rate I'm rose afraid. in Leicester. Sorry, the growth rate rose in Leicester. Mm -hmm. You know, so we had to be very careful as to how we plan this return to school. All but right. hopefully, Thank you very much. Ladi, I'm afraid that's where we have to end it in the interest of time. Oh. I want to say, Ladi Mohammed Chapman, thank you so very much for your thoughts. And of course, Fulayo Ajanaku, thank you both for your contributions. Thank, thank you, you for having much. us. Right.